the human boy again by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story seven the case for fowl one it's awfully difficult to understand why some boys are liked and some utterly barred i'm nearly sixteen now and i've been at merivale for years but still i can't see it all i know is that the chaps most boys like i don't and the very few chaps i like nobody else does at first i thought it was hampers and asked my mother to send me extra large ones which she did and such hampers as mine were never seen before in any school i should think but the boys ate my watermelons and peaches and many such unusual things just as if they were the wretched windfalls that masters gets from his father's orchards or the feeble home-made jam and common or garden cakes that come to other fellows on their birthdays then the very chaps that guzzle my rare things pretend afterwards i've tried to poison them and so on and young gregson who once ate half a bruised pineapple of mine that was a bit off got ill and after that only certain chaps would take the things i offered and nobody once all the time i've been here has ever offered me as much as a dry biscuit out of their beastly hampers i pointed this out to travers who though no friend of mine always appeared to have more sense in a general way than most fellows and he said you sneer so at chaps you always make it so jolly clear your hampers are the best in the world that naturally they think you wouldn't care about their things besides steggles did offer you three ripe pears for i saw him do it yes i said he did just because he knew they were overripe and thought to score off me i knew why he had done it and told him so then he offered them to me said travers so i can tell you that you are quite wrong i took them and ate them on the spot and they were perfectly good decent pears for once in a way steggles was quite straight and meant no harm at all well i saw after a bit that it wasn't hampers or anything of that sort and then i thought it was games but i wasn't going to make a fool of myself at footling games for anybody and i always did get out of them when i could however it wasn't altogether games either though certainly more games than hampers still there were chaps who didn't play games any better than me such as richards who always went to matches and was keen about games though useless himself and ford who made peculiar knots in rope and jameson who drew pictures in the chap's latin grammars of the remarkable things mentioned in syntax then another great thing showing what mean beasts most boys are is the fact that if certain masters like certain boys then other boys also like them once and only once i got jolly friendly with a master who was very much disliked indeed by everybody else i mean brown i never found him bad at first and he used me a good bit in many ways and nearly always gave me full marks but he changed frightfully over the business of the blackboard and it happened like this you see as brown thought well of me he confided in me a bit out for walks and i confided in him and he asked me a lot of questions concerning a lot of boys and as i hated them all i told him what he wanted to know he was frightfully obliged and said i was a power for good in the school and also said that such a boy as i am without silly ideas about sneaking may be of the greatest use to masters if he really has the welfare and interest of the school at heart he also gave me a knife and seemed pretty sure i should win several prizes at the end of the term in fact we got very friendly and i certainly did him a very good turn by helping him to understand why some boys didn't like him and telling him what they said about him behind his back he was greatly obliged to me and used the things i told him and scored pretty badly off some chaps as a result it rather surprised them to find how much he knew but it didn't make them like him any better then they began to try and score off him and finally owing to an unfortunate accident i got mixed up in it steggles did an unusual thing to young frost steggles had borrowed the matron's scissors to cut his toenails which were turning in and tearing his toes and making them pour with blood and after he had used them and shortened his toenails by about half an inch or so he kept them and told the matron that he had lost them 
then came young frost who was a sort of relation of trelawney who was at that time easily the best liked chap at merivale well steggles got young frost up into the gym alone as he thought and told him it was the rule for new boys to have their hair cut close to their heads because they often brought infection to merivale in that way so he cut all young frost's hair off and i was there hidden in a corner reading a grown-up novel that i had found in brown's room because brown as a great favour used to allow me in his study to see the remarkable things he has there chiefly on the mantelpiece including photographs of well-known actresses said to be signed by themselves so i saw steggles cut off frost's hair and i did not know steggles had seen me but he had and he made me swear not to tell which i did but knowing that an oath is not binding when the good of the school is involved i told brown about it and he took the credit to himself over it and taxed steggles with it of course steggles denied it and it couldn't be proved because young frost had a rotten idea it would be unsportsmanlike to sneak so it came about that brown couldn't do anything without getting me into a row and accordingly nothing was done to steggles but steggles did a lot to me because of course he knew i was the only person who could have told brown the truth as young frost hadn't then a rather clever beast called macmullen wrote a piece of poetry with rhymes and after about twenty copies of this poetry had been sent to me anonymously written round picture postcards macmullen got travers to print it up on the blackboard just before brown's mathematical lesson came on so when he arrived there it was staring at him and it was so exceedingly well printed that he could not possibly tell who had done it there is a young sneaker called fowl who ought to be made to howl for the things that brown knows which you would not suppose all come from that blighter called fowl i wanted to rub it out before brown came but of course the chaps wouldn't let me brown read this carefully and took such a long time looking at it that steggles said he was learning it by heart then he picked up the duster and slowly rubbed it out he made no remark whatever and for the time being the score rather missed fired on brown but it didn't miss fire on me because the next day when i was passing his study brown called me in and asked me about it he said who wrote that piece of impertinence on the blackboard yesterday and i said macmullen invented it sir and travers printed it up but i don't know who told them there was a sort of understanding between us then brown was greatly enraged and said how dare you say there is any understanding between us fowl such impertinence i never heard what do i know about you and your affairs excepting that you are deservedly a very unpopular boy and i'll thank you not to bring any more of your mean tales to me a tale-bearer is an odious thing so remember no more sneaking or it will be very much the worse for you i was so astonished that i couldn't do anything but stare now be off about your business said brown and i went that shows pretty well what mr brown was i should think the beastly ingratitude of the man seemed to me the most extraordinary thing that had ever happened and after that i never could do right with brown and he sided against me and never would listen to me even when i had to tell him things in self-defence i could easily show again and again that i was in the right and other chaps were in the wrong or masters too for that matter but it was not much good trying to convince people with the whole of them against me there was always a proper religious reason for the things i did and though sometimes they looked queer until explained i always could explain them but after i got to be hated nobody would so much as stop to listen to the explanations not even the doctor everybody said he was just and fair though an old footler but i know very well he wasn't owing to the time when corky minimus dropped a shilling in the playground and i found one there well how could i know that because corky minns had lost a shilling and i had found one the one i had found was bound to be the identical same shilling that corky had lost i shall always say it was frightfully unfair to me to order me to give up the shilling as the doctor did and then jaw me before the whole school once my father said to me always act from high motives roger and i always did 
but nobody ever gave me any credit for doing so and when i told the doctor over the affair of gurney's tame white rabbit which i found wandering alone in the playground after dark and killed with a cricket stump for fear that it would starve to death and was seen doing it by gurney who came to look for it when i told the doctor i had done this from the best motives and not because gurney had taken me down in class the day before he said that i was deceiving myself and told me that satan had put it into my heart to kill gurney's rabbit really i had only done it out of fear that a poor dumb creature would suffer and yet the doctor misunderstood me in such a wicked and spiteful way that he caned me and made me dig a grave and bury the brute in front of the whole school as a punishment as to my feelings which are frightfully keen nobody cares a button about them and i have to do things simply in self-defence that i should never do if i was treated fairly even tin lin chow when he was here had a better time than me and i could tell you a lot of things you wouldn't believe in the matter of tortures simply invented by steggles and others in order to be applied to me steggles has invented two sets of tortures called mind tortures and body tortures and the mind tortures are babyish but the body tortures are well worth avoiding so i always pretend the mind tortures are the worst whereas really only a fool would care for them as they mean nothing to anybody who is religious but what i meant to tell you was a fair case of the sort of things that happen to me and i have to endure i was told that i was to be tried by court-martial and i said why and trelawney the champion fighter of the school put the case before me he said it is well known in the lower school that you have got up more fights between kids than any other chap he then mentioned seven fights which he had written down now he said did you or did you not arrange those seven fights he had a lot of witnesses present and so i said five of them i arranged because i wanted to see if he interrupted me you go about asking chaps if they give one another best and when they say no though they may be perfectly friendly you go on at them till you work up a fight i denied it and he said you can reserve your beastly defence for the court-martial i've only got one more question to ask you at present namely have you ever fought anybody yourself and i said no trelawney i never have because it would be contrary to my opinions then he merely said i was a sticky and noxious worm that wanted poisoning with rat poison and that nothing more need be said before the court-martial two well the court-martial though held by the sixth was grossly unfair and the thing they decided to do was simply cruel bullying in a superior form to begin with mcmullen who is the champion speaker at our debates was the leading witness against me whereas i had nobody to speak for me because though i was told three days before the trial to get somebody to speak for me of course nobody would and i had to stick up for myself which was a thing i never could do so i went down and the fools pretended to prove that i had arranged hundreds of fights and been second at scores and yet somehow i had never fought a single fight myself from the time i came there dozens of kids were called to witness at the court-martial that i had given them best rather than fight them and many were much younger than me and one called foster was only eleven though certainly he was a great fighter and many boys of fourteen had to give him best in the long run though not till after they had fought him and been licked well just because my religious opinions kept me from fighting anybody and especially foster they called me an insect and a coward and a disgrace to the school and so on then trelawney as the head of the court-martial gave a verdict and i was sentenced to have a fight whether i liked it or not inquiries were made and finally the court-martial found a chap called andrews who was in my class and whose age was just one week less than mine this andrews and me they decided must fight and when it was known everybody wanted to be second for andrews and nobody wanted to be second for me trelawney said we might have a week to train and then the court-martial broke up it was a brutal bit of work altogether and i found rather an interesting thing which was that andrews felt quite differently to the affair to me i talked to him privately as soon as i could and pretended it was all rot and laughed at the whole thing 
but he said it wasn't rot at all as far as he was concerned he was a new boy and rather keen to make friends and be well thought of so he considered this a jolly good opportunity and began to train as well as he knew how i saw at a glance that he could lick me for i'd never learned fighting and hated hurting anything i'm sure always and i argued a good deal with andrews about it he said that his father had told him that a chance to make friends and distinguish himself would be sure to come and andrews said no doubt his father was right and that the chance had come and that he was going to distinguish himself as much as he could on me well of course i saw what had to be done just at that time i was rather unfairly hated by dr dunstan because of an affair in the playground there was a fir tree in it at one corner and i had found that turpentine came out if you cut notches in it well into this turpentine i stuck live ants and then burnt them up with a burning glass it was nothing but old briggs the writing master and natural history master discovered me doing it and must needs make a ridiculous fuss he told the doctor and the doctor made a ridiculous fuss too and turned against me and hated me so dunstan was out of the question and there was only one other master i could tell and that was monsieur michel the french master but he was weak and useless in an emergency like this so finally i decided that the proper person to approach would be andrews himself that much was pretty easy to decide and then came the question what to say to him and i was helped in this matter by a very lucky thing it came out in class that andrews was an absolute flyer at geography and though not as good as me me being head of the class in that subject still he jolly soon got second to me and stopped there i am a tremendous dab at geography myself and if i knew as much about other things i should be in the sixth and if a good many things i know especially about religious saints were regular subjects in school instead of being barred altogether i should also be in the sixth and finding out the greatness of andrews at geography gave me the idea i wanted which happened only just in time because the day i spoke to him was a wednesday and the next saturday was the day we had to fight i said aren't you looking forward to saturday and he said yes i am and i said so am i because i'm in training too and i find that i fight tremendously well and i'm only sorry i hadn't to fight a lot sooner but i couldn't deceive him with this for a moment so i soon changed the subject i introduced prizes and said that the doctor was particularly keen about the subject of geography and always gave the best prizes for that i know he said and i should have had a jolly good chance if it hadn't been for you you would i said in fact but for me you would be a snip for it we talked a bit and then i said i wonder if your father would rather you made your mark by fighting me or by winning the geography prize in your first term of course to win any prize in your first term is a great score for a chap he said that he hadn't thought of it and after i pressed him a lot he admitted that there was no doubt the prize would suit his mother best but he thought very likely if he won a fight it would suit his father best he said my father's a soldier and i'm going to be one and so naturally fighting is more in my line than geography but i doubted this and in fact i proved that a mere fight was nothing whereas geography was a great deal and at least as much use to a soldier as fighting especially after he had lost a battle finally he said that i might be right but that it didn't much matter as i was bound to win the geography prize and he was equally bound to lick me next saturday then i made my great offer i said look here i'm not afraid of fighting or anything like that but i've got religious objections to it and in fact though your father might like you to fight my father would get into a frightful bait if i did really it might be jolly serious for me and it would not matter to my father in the least whether i won the fight or lost it andrew said that had nothing to do with him so i went on and explained how it might have a great deal to do with him i said you see if you lose the fight your father would very likely be very sick about it and instead of getting rewarded you might get nothing 
whereas if the fight fell through and you merely said firmly you had no reason for fighting me and were not going to do it just because you were ordered to and then went and won the geography prize that would be a much greater score for you he admitted it might be but didn't see how he could beat me at geography then i said if you refuse to fight me you shall get the geography prize because i need not put down anything like all i know and can boss a lot of questions purposely he said it would please my mother and might do me a lot of good with my grandmother and i said it certainly would and next term if you still want a fight i'll easily arrange one for you with somebody else and then you can make it all right with your father he said will you solemnly swear on human blood that you will boss the geography paper and let me get the prize and to show him how much in earnest i was i took out my knife there and then and he pricked his finger and i pricked mine and then i swore that i would let him have the geography prize and he swore that he would refuse to fight me i felt that was a pretty good day's work and so did he but i felt it all the time whereas andrews only felt it in stray moments and between whiles was a jolly savage with himself for swearing the blood oath he was frightfully scorned for not fighting me and the only thing that comforted him and that only in secret was that his mother and grandmother would be full of rejoicing in the holidays and richly reward him for winning the geography prize in fact he kept on so obstinately about his mother that i began to think about mine and the sad grief it would be to her if i did not win this prize as usual after a time i realized that i had actually put andrews before my own dear mother and i felt very shocked to think of what i had done the end of the term began to get nearer and nearer and the exams were going to begin soon i tried hard not to think about geography and not to think about my mother but andrews found the only subjects that interested him were these subjects and at last i simply had to avoid andrews because he kept on to such a sickening extent about what a score it would be to win it very strange thoughts came over me during those days and i got more and more undecided as to what was right to do there was my duty to andrews who in a vague sort of way had got the right to win the geography prize and there was my duty to my father who paid dr dunstan a lot of money for letting me come to merivale and naturally expected me to do my best which i always did do i'm sure then there was my duty to dr dunstan and to deceive him deliberately about my knowledge of geography was of course a very wrong thing to do and greatest of all there was my own conscience which is the still small voice of the bible besides i had been very careful to say that andrew should have the geography prize not that he should win it no chap ever tried harder than me to do the right thing and what made it so difficult was that my conscience and my duty to everybody but andrew's was on one side while the stupid affair with andrew's was on the other side of course a blood oath is all nonsense if you are a christian and not in the least minding to a religious person in fact only savages believe in it at all therefore as far as that went i did not feel in the least bound to andrews if i had not been coming back the next term i should have seen my way clearer very likely but i was and so was andrews somehow i couldn't decide till the actual day of the geography exam and then strangely enough the paper seemed simply to have been made for me i knew the answer to everything and question number six gave me a chance of saying some jolly good and peculiar things about spain and the holy inquisition not generally known at all probably not a soul at merivale but the doctor and me knew them somehow i felt it would be mean and wicked to pretend not to know all these things my conscience simply cried out to me to do the paper as well as possible and leave the result in higher hands because if providence meant andrews to win he would win so i did my best as i usually do and when the result was put up it was found that i had beaten andrews by one hundred and ten marks and andrews was a long way ahead of everybody else naturally andrews not understanding what it is to have such delicate feelings as me was a good bit annoyed but i was ready for him and though i did not tell of my secret struggles to do right which he would not have understood i did explain that i had acted from proper motives i said 
i promised that you should have the geography prize not that you should win it you shall have it and the minute i get it on prize day i shall hand it over to you but andrews did not fall in with this and i felt somehow that he wouldn't he said several revengeful things about next term but he may be dead before then and anyway much will happen in the holidays to make him forget this affair or take a better view of it i only mention the thing in fact to show how hard it is to make chaps understand you if you always try to do right as much as you can i should clearly like to leave merivale but there seems to be no chance of it at present my father often says rather unkindly that nobody ever wanted honour and truth and decency and manliness licked into them worse than i do but my mother who always understands me much better than him says that many of the best and most famous men in the world have looked back to their school days with hatred and loathing and so i must no doubt be one of them because nobody ever hated boys and masters and school in general worse than me it will be very different when i get away from them all and go into the world and because there i shall meet plenty of nice people who think the same as i do End of chapter seven story eight of the human boy again by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story eight cherry ripe one this is an awfully rum story about the extraordinary cunning of a man generally known as cherry ripe from selling cherries and to tell it right i must first explain about our cricket ground and a wood and a field after the cricket ground comes a narrow wood well known as the place for fights and also wood pigeons nest which breed there in great quantities it is a long and narrow wood and then comes a field also long but not so narrow this field is a very up and down field with hollows in it and at the bottom in one corner a drinking place for cows has been arranged where yellow irises grow in summer and where most of our tame frogs come from there is a clump of trees in this field and a hawk once built in them but freckles found the nest and took the eggs so the hawk did not build there again after the up and down field there comes an old rather broken wall and inside the wall is the orchard and nursery garden of cherry ripe needless to say his real name was not cherry ripe but jenkins not any relation to the jenkins at merivale though chaps who wanted to rot jenkins always pretended that cherry ripe was his father which much annoyed jenkins because this cherry ripe was a fierce and a common man and had been known to be dismissed with a caution for ill-treating a horse and was no friend to us either he made his living by fruit and vegetables and at the right season of the year sold cherries of which he had many fine trees in his nursery garden he also had apples and pears and gooseberries in great abundance he also laid out large pieces of his nursery garden in spring flowers for market and he grew onions and turnips and rhubarb and many other uninteresting things we naturally went there to see how it looked from time to time and he chased us a good deal over the field but when we were once in the wood he was of course powerless in fact he never caught anybody in fair hunting except chilvers who was once down by the pond collecting waterman beetles in his shoe having nothing else to do it with but chilvers had never been in the nursery garden in his life and told cherry ripe so only he refused to believe chilvers and said that he was trespassing just as much in the field as he would have been in the orchard which in its paltry way was true chilvers then offered him a penny and an indian coin for twelve waterman beetles and all he did was to say no cheek and box chilvers on the ear and tell him to be off and so he made a bitter enemy of chilvers this cherry ripe was old and ugly he never seemed to shave and yet his beard never seemed to grow what there was looked a mangy gray streaked with brown he wore an old hat that had once been black but now was rather inclined to turn green and he had glittering eyes one of which watered he had also a curious way of lifting up and down his eyebrows which young smith said showed a bad disposition and was common to gorillas 
he had been heard to laugh when picking apples with his daughters but he never laughed at us and when we took to calling him cherry ripe he hated us and often shook his fist at us from a distance so we then felt something had to be done against him to score off him when this was decided upon steggles and methuen and pedlar and myself me being weston minor and chilvers went into committee as it is called and in fact we had a regular meeting many others wanted to join but we felt five was enough and we all had a jolly special private good reason for going into committee against cherry ripe chilvers of course had been licked by cherry ripe because to box one's ears is the same as licking one in a very insulting manner pedlar also had been insulted and a good deal hurried twice by cherry ripe when he found him catapulting quite harmlessly in his orchard in december when of course there was nothing to take but vegetables and methuen and steggles once meeting cherry ripe going the rounds with his cart and fruit and scales for weighing things had politely stopped him and asked to buy two pennyworth of pears and cherry ripe had the frightful impertinence to say that no chap wearing them hats should have so much as a spring onion of his growing which was not only turning away business but cheeking the school colours openly so it seemed about time to do something and we accordingly did i may say that i had no particular grudge against cherry ripe but i was well known at being better at wall climbing than any chap who ever came to maryvale climbing had always been my strong point and as i was also going to be a missionary later in life i kept it up because you never know not if you are a missionary the committee merely decided that as the cherry season was now near we had better wait for it and then at the first opportunity make a jameson raid this is a particular sort of raid invented by the great dr jameson of south africa and it consists of doing something so suddenly that nobody is ready a jameson raid is useless if the other side is prepared it is also useless if you are not prepared yourself the great thing is to be first and also an important point is to commit the raid where and when it will be least expected therefore we gave it out hoping that it would somehow get to cherry ripe that we meant to make a raid on his young apples on wednesday being a half holiday whereas the truth was we were going to have a dash at his cherries on the saturday there was a cricket match on that day and steggles arranged details i won't say much about what happened because the thing failed even more fearfully than dr jameson's affair long ago we were deceived in a most peculiar manner owing to the deliberate cunning of cherry ripe and afterwards talking it over while we wrote two thousand latin lines each we came to the conclusion that there was a traitor at work naturally we thought of fowl but fowl knew nothing besides he was in the hospital at the time with something the matter with his knee to go back i must explain that all went well until we got on the top of cherry ripe's wall then what should we see but cherry ripe up a cherry tree and his daughters down below they were a long way off and we saw at a glance that it would take cherry ripe about a year to climb down from his tree even if he saw us as for his daughters seeing our ages were fifteen and upwards except chilvers who was certainly only thirteen but could run faster than his sister who was seventeen we did not fear them as cherry ripe was picking cherries we went for the green gooseberries i dropped down first in a very stealthy manner that freckles had taught me before he went home to australia then pedlar and methuen dropped and then chilvers he fell rather awkwardly and smashed off a large purple cabbage and was glad of it but steggles stopped on the wall for some private reason he said afterwards when taxed with treachery that it wasn't so in the least but that from the very beginning he had had a curious feeling when he woke up that day it is the feeling you get when you wake up on a day that you are going to be flogged and you have the same feeling only far far worse on the day when you are going to be hung all criminals know this steggles certainly shouted to cave as soon as the horrible moment came but when he did finally drop off the wall it was on the other side in fact he escaped and left us to our fate nothing could be done to steggles but we never felt the same to him again 
what happened was this we were just eating a few gooseberries rather fast before settling down steadily to fill our pockets when steggles gave the alarm but it was too late suddenly there sprang up from their hiding places no less than three men the youngest not less than twenty years old and the oldest was cherry ripe himself this so much horrified us as we had seen him at the top of a high cherry tree two hundred yards away only a second before that we lost our instinct of self-preservation and fell a prey to the enemy we were all caught in fact except steggles and we were then marched down to cherry ripe's house and then along the road and so back to merivale his hateful daughters stood and sniggered at us as we were taken past them and then we saw that the whole thing was a mean plot and in fact a swizz a swizz is a chows and a chows is the same as a cell it was a scarecrow in the tree and not cherry ripe at all the scarecrow wore his green hat and his daughters pretended to be talking to him as peter said afterwards sherlock holmes himself would have been almost deceived by such a deadly plot afterwards we found curiously enough that we had collected exactly thirteen gooseberries before the crash came which shows that thirteen is an unlucky number whatever scientific people may say against it cherry ripe brought us back to merivale and came to the front door and asked to see the doctor he gave his name as mr jenkins of the merivale and district fruit farm and said it in a very grand tone of voice as if he was somebody but the doctor a little knowing what was going to happen sent out to tell mr jenkins to walk in pedlar said he thought that the doctor probably hoped cherry ripe had come with an advantageous offer to supply merivale with green stuff at low prices but of course this was not so dr dunstan received us in his study and he was much surprised to see chilvers appear after cherry ripe and still more surprised to see the rest of us come behind and what may be the meaning of this deputation said the doctor perhaps you methuen will explain but cherry ripe said that he had come to do the explaining certainly he told the truth but he told it in a beastly mean way he said there's times when a man has got to stand up for his rights mister meaning the doctor and this is one of em these here young rips be always driving my life out of me and an example must be made i was half in a mind to send for a policeman but i thought as i'd give em one more chance for their parents sake so brought em to you because no doubt you be paid very well for larnin em their lessons and keepin em out of mischief i've got two things against em and one is that they bawl cherry ripe after me morning noon and night and take sights at me and do many other rude things and the other is that now this minute i've catched em red-handed in my gooseberry bed tucking down my fruit for all they were worth that's trespass and it's also theft and i don't want no more of it thank you said the doctor you have stated your case with a lucidity and force that does you no little credit mr jenkins now the accused and the accuser may freely speak whilst i as arbiter between them reserve the last word and i fear the last action also his eyes roamed over to the corner where the canes were kept then he went on your indictment consists of three articles and we will take them in your own order you submit that these youths have insulted you have trespassed on your private property and have stolen your goods now boy pedlar have you or have you not at any time and in any public place addressed mr jenkins of the merivale and district fruit farm as a cherry ripe yes sir said pedlar methuen yes sir weston yes sir chilvers yes sir the doctor seemed disappointed and cherry ripe smiled with a grim and scornful smile to accost an honest purveyor of the fruits of the earth with words which in the nature of his calling it is necessary that he should himself loudly repeat at intervals to do this is a senseless and offensive act said the doctor nothing can be said in favour of it no earthly benefit not even the meretricious semblance of benefit can accrue to the boy who balls a cherry ripe after somebody else the operation shows a lack of mental balance that may make us fear for the sanity of the performer and regard the probable course of his future with dismay and the liveliest foreboding 
but now we are faced with accusations of a very different character it is asserted that you four boys have gone out of bounds and disobeyed me that you have trespassed on another's private property and so made of no account the laws of man and lastly that you have taken fruit that did not belong to you that you have broken the eighth commandment and thus shattered the sacred edict of your maker the doctor worked this up as only he can till we saw what an immense number of laws we had broken all at once like you do when you begin to play golf and of course it was a very solemn moment for everybody even cherry ripe looked rather frightened the doctor rolled it out and shook his finger at cherry ripe as much as at us and then came the questions is this infamous imputation true edgar methuen yes sir and you harold pedlar yes sir weston yes sir chilvers chilvers like a little fool tried to hedge against the future yes and i'm very sorry sir he said the doctor looked at us as if we were some new sort of animals and he didn't know how we had got in he gave a tremendous snort and took off his glasses and then he turned to cherry ripe to attempt any analysis of my personal emotions at this juncture would be vain he said in these cases introspection may well be left for a subsequent occasion for the moment justice cries with trumpet tongue and be under no apprehension jenkins that justice will miscarry on this occasion as an agriculturalist here the doctor forgot us and talked like anything to cherry ripe about growing vegetables and ceres and pomona and horace and virgil and other well-known people out of school books he fairly terrified cherry ripe i believe anyway cherry ripe kept creeping nearer and nearer to the door then at last he got in a word don't be too hard on em this time your honour just one two and another on the place that's made for it pardon me answered the doctor raising his hand you now trench on my prerogative jenkins the question of what is to follow may very well be left with the preceptor of these fallen boys have no fear for that and to plead for leniency before the breaking of a commandment is to admit a personal laxity of view that i for one am bound to deplore cherry ripe had now reached the door and i believe he thought that if he stopped another moment the doctor would cane him too so he began to clear out but first he said well good evening all then he hooked it rather thankfully and we wished we could we got four on each hand and two thousand lines each and to stop in for two half holidays so that as methuen very truly remarked was first blood for cherry ripe two of course this was merely the beginning of the great anti-cherry ripe feeling and next term we were planning a deadly revenge with regard to cherry ripe's kentish cobnuts which were remarkably fine when a great assistant came to our aid in the shape of trelawney this was that trelawney who had such a terrible end in the matter of the protest of the wing dormitory but many things happened first he was fourteen and a fighter from the beginning all his relations were also fighters and poetry had been made about one who was condemned to death for magnificent fighting in historic times this trelawney by the most curious accident proved to know an immense deal about cherry ripe and it came out that trelawney's father who was a retired soldier and only a colonel though trelawney said that if justice had been done he would be a general at least actually owned miles of land about merivale including cherry ripe's nursery garden and the field the beggar merely rents it from my father for so many pounds a year said trelawney why if i said a word to my father i could have the man turned out altogether and his daughters and everybody i'll jolly soon teach him this was a pretty good score for us and we soon arranged to show cherry ripe that things were changed trelawney took to strolling about in cherry ripe's field as if it belonged to him and of course as i pointed out to trelawney when his father died though i hoped it would not be for ten years at least still he had to and when he did the field and the orchard and everything would actually be trelawney's own to do with what he liked he said it was so and he said that he would jolly soon clear cherry ripe out and build almshouses for old soldiers broken in the wars when he came to have the ground 
he wouldn't take nuts or anything he said that was paltry but he had a fixed idea that he ought to be perfectly free of the place and he went on strolling about in it till at last cherry ripe surprised him down at the pond in the field i was there too but cherry ripe didn't recognize me which uh, no doubt was lucky he seemed to have something on his mind for he didn't get into a bait but merely said now you boys you slope off to your playground can't have you messing around here perhaps you don't know who you're talking to mr jenkins said trelawney in a frightfully grand tone of voice then cherry ripe jumped lord the sauce of your nippers nowadays why can't your old gentleman over there teach you manners as well as figures and all the rest of it clearly he meant no less a person than dr dunstan my name is trelawney began trelawney a very fine name too said cherry ripe take care you never bring no discredit on it there's a good boy my father is your landlord said trelawney and i'll thank you not to call me boy cherry ripe was by no means so much struck by this as you might have expected you're the colonel's young shaver eh well i hope you'll turn out as sensible a man though i do wish me and him saw alike on the subject of a new tomato house however everybody's a right to his own opinion trelawney was fuming like a train wanting to start you don't seem to understand he said that this very field we're in at this moment will be mine before long the colonel's not ailing i hope said cherry ripe very civilly i could now see that mr jenkins was laughing at trelawney but luckily trelawney did not see this or he might have taken some very desperate step and i want to say further went on trelawney not answering about his father that as this land will be mine sooner or later i have a perfect right to walk on it when and where i choose agreed said cherry ripe and as i'm renting the land and don't like rude little boys poking about where there's no business i've got a perfect right to pull their ears for em when i catches em so that's settled now we know where we are be off with you both or i'll begin this minute trelawney was as furious as a grown man he turned a sort of colour like stewed fruit but of course we had to go there was nothing else we could do for the moment i shall write to my father about this and you'll soon find out you can't insult your own landlord's son with impunity trelawney shouted as we got through the hedge back into our wood can't do better and tell him what i said answered cherry ripe then he seemed to forget us and stood quite still looking into the pond evidently he had other things on his mind besides trelawney but trelawney didn't think so and believe that jenkins was standing like that in a frightful funk to think of the dangerous thing he'd done however it's too late now i shall write to my father next sunday said trelawney and he did and he got a letter back we were rather keen to hear what his father was going to do about it and expected he would read it out to us but he tore the letter up small and chucked it away and merely said he was surprised to find his father didn't agree with him but i'll make it clear that the man ought to be sacked when i go home said trelawney funnily enough though he'd torn this letter up so small and flung it scornfully away we found out afterwards what was in it because peters who hoped to be a detective of crime when he grew up always collected anything with writing on it to decipher mysteries and it was him who found out what johnson's pet name at home was and how many sisters west had and other things not generally known he said if a letter was once torn up and flung away that it was public property for a detective and so when trelawney had gone peters collected the bits of his letter and pieced it together after taking frightful trouble it was a detective-like thing but not a sportsman-like thing to do and trelawney when he came to hear of it challenged peters in fact they fought and peters was badly licked still the letter certainly was rather curious considering it came from trelawney's own father it read like this dear teddy i've got your letter and i've dropped a line to jenkins directing him to give you and any of your friends a real good hiding every time he catches you on his ground your affectionate father trelor trelawney of course the thing couldn't be allowed to stop there we were all on trelawney's side though his father wasn't 
in fact pedlar and methuen and me were rather vexed with trelawny's father and we told trelawny so and he said he was too he said we'll be revenged next term as it is too late this we must all think of a heavy score against jenkins he never called cherry ripe anything but jenkins for some reason and the best idea is the one we'll carry out and everybody interested in the matter quite agreed but steggles did not come into it because trelawny utterly barred steggles from the first three next term the great idea of how to crush cherry ripe came to me out of the bible i let everybody speak first and then as nobody had said anything like as good i said we will do what the enemy did in the new testament and sow tares in his ground everybody thought the idea fine but jolly difficult and chilvers asked what are tares i said i wasn't exactly sure and methuen said it was a sort of grass and trelawny said it was a parable anyhow we didn't know where to buy them finally we decided not to ask for tares but some sort of seed that would grow quickly and get a deep hold of the ground and ruin everything else for yards around unfortunately we didn't know much about wild things in general and we asked tompkins who is our champion botanist and he said willow herb but there were no seeds about at that time of year it being february and so trelawny said we will confide in batson who is well known to be the son of a greengrocer and seedsman but it happened that batson who was the gardener's boy at dunstan's was leaving to better himself however there was just time before he went and we let him into our secret score against cherry ripe and gave him two shillings with which to buy some seed of some vigorous growing thing to sow in cherry ripe's nursery garden and choke his vegetables when they came up batson said that he would do his best he said it might have to be grass seed or clover but he promised it would be a good choking thing certainly it looked hopeful because he soon brought a bag of seeds and said they were a kind of clover that if once sown could not be got out of the ground again without ploughing then came the question of the time and we decided that next saturday was the day there happened to be a big game at football but not a little one so we were all free excepting methuen who kept goal for the first all went well and when the match began to get exciting owing to hands being given against bray in our twenty-five trelawny and pedlar and chilvers and i went into the wood unseen and got to the cherry ripe side of it chaps had been in his field a good deal lately hunting for a very beautiful red fungus that was to be found in the hedges on dead sticks and cherry ripe had been a good deal worried by them then came the first surprise of that day there was a huge board stuck up in the field facing our wood with these remarkable words on it danger beware of the bull our first step was to get back into the hedge the field seemed to be quite empty but there are many hollows in it and a bull might easily have been sitting down quite near us or it might have been hidden in the cluster of trees in the middle one thing was clear it was not at the pond trelawny said this man is worth fighting i'm glad he's got a bull because it makes more strategy necessary for us and pedlar said and i'm glad too but i was not glad and so i didn't say so and as for chilvers he went further and openly said that he thought a bull altered everything it was about a hundred and fifty yards across the field from the wood to cherry ripe's wall and it is well known that a bull can run three times as fast as a man and five times as fast as a boy i reminded trelawny of this and he said i know all that it is a question of strategy and i said yes but strategy won't alter facts he thought a bit and said you chaps stop here and i'll reconnoitre but pedlar who was nearly six months older than trelawny said he ought to reconnoitre too finally they both went to reconnoitre in different directions and came back in five minutes neither had seen the bull there's no bull said trelawny it's a subterfuge come on wait said chilvers i have a feeling it's not a subterfuge something tells me there is a bull trelawny said it was cowardice and chilvers said it was a presentiment anyway no time could be lost and chilvers was firm so we left him 
he was half inclined to come but said that an uncle of his had once been gored by a buffalo or some such thing in america and somehow he felt that this particular adventure would not suit him though he would have feared nothing else of course trelawney explained that this was no excuse even if true but though white and very worried chilvers was firm he refused to follow so we went alone we made a detour of the trees in the middle of the field and crept forward in indian file fifty yards from the wall pedlar whispered that he saw something red in a hollow which might easily be a bull's back so trelawney said sprint and we threw off caution to the winds and sprinted so we got to the wall in safety and as if to reward us for the effort what should we see on the other side but a beautiful bit of ground all prepared for seeds it was smoothed and arranged and little narrow trenches had been drawn in it about an inch deep evidently for seeds it was frightful luck and playing into the hands of the enemy as trelawney said he instantly gave the word and we dropped there was not a soul in sight only a spade and two rakes where the man who had been working had left them a commander always seizes any chance the enemy offers said trelawney pour the seed pretty thick along the drills and everywhere else then take the rakes and rake it all over until everything is quite smooth so all cherry ripe's arrangements for planting seed were used by us to sow a particularly deadly sort of clover we worked jolly hard and in about five minutes the thing was done by me and pedlar while trelawney mounted guard then the exciting work began and trelawney shouted take cover they're coming but there was no cover and so we all got back the way we had come and just as cherry ripe and a man ran up from another part of the garden we reached the top of the wall and prepared to leap down but luckily we didn't in fact even as it was we only just saved pedlar and lugged him back in time the bull had arrived he was there not more than twenty yards from the wall and he was a whacker he had an enormous body and head and his forehead was curly and his eyes fierce and his horns rather short but very thick a copper ring was in his nose and his hoofs turned up rather curiously like turkish slippers there was some hay flung down in front of him and he was smelling it he was evidently a large and fierce bull and him being on one side of the wall and cherry ripe on the other made it a very tricky position for us on the top trelawney said this is critical and cherry ripe said hello my brave chap how do you find your future property is looking i hope you're pretty well satisfied trelawney said this is a case for a parley but cherry ripe did all the parleying we sat down on the wall which was easier and safer than standing on it we sat with our faces to cherry ripe and our backs to the bull this is an ambuscade in a way said trelawney in fact we are rather scored off in war we should be shot not that it would matter as we would have done our work now my young shavers began cherry ripe i see you've been very busy down here on your own account so perhaps you'll just step off that wall and do a bit of work for me you can take your choice either we'll all go straight along to your old gentleman and see what he'll say and do about it or you can step down here all three of you and set to work over a bit of weeding take your choice and be quick we'll confer said trelawney which we did do and pedlar and i thought one thing and trelawney thought another he said that it would be far more dignified to go back and suffer from dr dunstan as an equal but pedlar and i had done that before and we didn't care in the least about the dignity we said that to do a bit of weeding for cherry ripe would be mere child's play to four on each hand and perhaps more not to mention a few thousand lines chucked in and a couple of half holidays gone so trelawney said i'm outvoted in the conference then he got down and we got down also cherry ripe seemed rather pleased at what we had decided to do because i don't think he wanted to have another talk with the doctor any more than we did but he certainly had arranged rather a big job for us you've got to pick it clean mind you roots and all he said then he divided the bit of land into three with sticks and it seemed to us that we had to weed about as much as a cricket pitch each 
you shall have the biggest job young master he said to trelawney and that's only right and fair because you're such a big man and take such big views trelawney did not answer but he was evidently in a very proud frame of mind he seemed determined to show cherry ripe something if it was only how to weed we worked jolly hard and cherry ripe kept us at it then in the distance went up three cheers and we knew the match was over and from the sound of the cheers it looked as if we'd won because after a match we always cheer the enemy and we always cheer him heartier if we beat him not intentionally but still the sound is different now you can all nip back said cherry ripe better go the way you came through the wood and be killed by your bull i suppose said pedlar not likely we have accepted your terms said trelawney and if you are an honourable foe you'll let us out by the gate better go through the wood answered cherry ripe it's a lot shorter and as to the old bull you needn't mind him he's my daughter's pet he wouldn't hurt a daddy longlegs much less a nice young chap like you tame isn't the word for him a pet lamb's fierce to him come on i'll go as far as the wood with you if you're frightened all this was true and when we got back into the field cherry ripe scratched the bull's curly head and the bull almost purred it was the mildest and humblest sort of a bull you ever saw though so huge and to see such an enormous and happy bull so close was rather interesting in its way in fact we all gave it a pat just to be able to say in after life that we had patted a monstrous bull my youngest daughter often sits on his back said cherry ripe this here bull has got a heart of gold i do assure you another strategy said trelawney to me certainly the man's cunning is frightful i think i shall tell him about the seed just to show him we've scored a bit too i advised not but trelawney was so stung by the way we'd been defeated all round by the wretched cherry ripe that as we were leaving him he said it may interest you to know that we've sowed that patch of your beastly ground under the wall with weeds of the deadliest sort in fact you'll never get them out again so that's one for us anyway well done said cherry ripe where did you get the seed from that's our business answered trelawney anyway you'll find it out presently well answered cherry ripe i know where you got the seed it was from my good friend batson and his boy be coming here to work next week he's learned all your gardener at the school can teach him and that wouldn't sink a ship he brought the tale to his father and his father brought it to me and so i got the ground ready for you knowing what a dashing fellow you are and what a hurry you'd be in more fool you then said trelawney not so fast the seed you sowed was lettuce seed good evening my dears and when you say your prayers afore you go to sleep to-night you can all thank the lord that you've done a bit of honest useful work for once in your lives we talked it over during prep and pedlar said on the whole we'd better keep this afternoon's work to ourselves and i said we were overreached by superior cunning and we'd better give cherry ripe best in future and trelawney said wait this in a way is a defeat but i'll arrange a jolly good waterloo for cherry ripe yet meaning of course that he would be wellington and that cherry ripe would be merely napoleon however though i didn't say it to trelawney i doubt very much if he is clever enough to score off cherry ripe till he grows up then of course cherry ripe will find him a bitter and relentless foe End of chapter eight Story nine of the Human Boy Again by Eden Philpotts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story nine The Quarry. If your parents happen to live in India, of course holidays are not all they might be, because India is too far to go to often, and such relations as aunts and uncles don't seem much to care to have you if you are the son of an Indian soldier but grandmothers always seem to want to have you at least they do in the case of travers but his parents are dead anyway me and morris have to stop at dr dunstan's for holidays and so we have to be friends at those times i am eleven and he is twelve and we are very different him being never known to lose a conduct mark and me being ordinary 
i am called foster and the happiest day of my life was when i got ten shillings all at once being my ninth birthday in a postal order from my father the first feeling was one of sheer joy and the second feeling was that if it had been a pound it would have been better i remember the birthday only too well though nearly two years ago because immediately after getting the money i wrote to mr gammage the grand toy and games man for some important things wanted by me and my chum smith him that cut off the doctor's tiger's tail with such disastrous results and by great ill luck that beast steggles looked over my shoulder and saw how i had begun my letter i had asked smith how to begin it in a very respectful way so as to please mr gammage and smith had said i should make it as friendly as you possibly can and i had said yes then i thought that as the friendliest letters i ever write are to my mother i would begin it like that and i had written down darling mr gammage i shall be very greatly obliged by your sending me if you have time by return of post certain things because mr gammage was quite as much to me as my mother in those days if not more well the beastly steggle saw this and set up a loud and hideous yell of laughter which was very painful to me and smith and presently when he had drawn the attention of many chaps to the letter he told us on no account to send it but to write in a firm and a manly tone and order the things he said when you are sending postal orders you have always the right to be firm and manly and when you are asking for them that is the time to be affectionate so we wrote the letter again and merely said dear mr gammage and signed ourselves yours truly arnold foster and huxley smith i must now return to morris who was left at merivale with me during the great summer holiday last year in a way his luck was frightful although he had nowhere to go in holidays even his amusements were such that they turned into marks and pleased the masters such as natural history and his conduct marks were so extraordinary that he never lost any at all without an effort in face he was nothing being sandy-haired and pale with a remarkably small mouth and watery eyes he had not much courage but was fond of chaps who had and he liked me and smith more for our courage than anything we tried without success to increase his courage and he helped us a lot with work that didn't want courage but only intellect of which he had a great deal it was really owing to my courage that the adventure of the old slate quarry happened you see the holiday competition for that year was a collection of insect life such as beetles moths and butterflies and as merivale happened to be a fine place for insect life in general morris determined to win the prize if he could when the doctor and his family went off to the seaside the last thing he said to me and morris was this farewell my dear lads pursue all innocent pleasures and give no course of offence during the vacation the matron will be at your service and she has the key of the library the playing field is also open to you and having regard for the season i relax a little of the rigid discipline of time and place of hours and boundaries proper to the term but i put you on your honour in this matter and feel that the chastening influence of morris will possibly serve to restrain the native exuberance of foster lastly i have directed that the commissariat shall be ordered on a generous nay lavish scale good-bye my dear boys and god bless you we said good-bye and i hoped that the doctor and mrs dunston and the girl dunstons would have a good time and the doctor thanked me and said he was glad i had the grace to make that wish and after he had gone morris said that he very nearly said god bless you to the doctor but stayed just in time and i said it was jolly lucky he had for it certainly would have been frightful cheek to do it then two cabs rolled away with the doctor and his luggage and his family and me and morris were left we found what commissariat meant at dinner and i will say that the food was magnificent and the matron was a brick all through the holidays very different to what she is in term time and she told us a lot about her private life which turned out that she was a widow matron with a son and morris said why don't you bring your son here matron and i said of course why don't you 
and morris said it would hurt the doctor's feelings a good deal if he knew you had a son being educated somewhere else and she said it was all right and the doctor was as kind as any man could be and that the son was working hard and was a very good son being an office boy in a lawyer's office in london then came the quarry and my temptation of morris which ended in morris going to the quarry the quarry was certainly out of bounds and it was when out of bounds in secret with freckles and other big chaps that i found all the wonders of it it was a stone quarry in merivale great wood and there were game preserves near by where freckles hunted and practised to be a bush ranger when he went home to australia but of course morris had never seen the place because he never went out of bounds at all from fear and also from goodness but chiefly from fear i said to morris on a fine day in the middle of august have you got any dragonflies in your collection and he said there are no dragonflies in merivale and i said you're a liar and he said well anyway i never saw one and i said in the old quarry in merivale great wood there are billions and he said they can't live without water to cool their tails and i said any fool knows that there's a stream and a pond in the quarry and the dragonflies and blackberries and butterflies including peacocks and red admirals are all as common as dirt it's a frightful pity it's out of bounds said morris to me and i explained that though out of bounds in term time yet owing to the doctor's special words to us before he went on his holiday everything was free now then morris said he put us on our honour and i said i've got just as much honour as you for that matter but my honour covers the whole of merivale great wood and if your honour doesn't do the same you'll lose the dragonflies morris thought over this a good deal and at last he said there's no doubt that slade and probably thompson minor will get dragonflies in their collections owing to their living by swamps and rivers and i said do what you like only it happens i'm going to the quarry to-morrow for the whole day and matron is going to make me sandwiches to take if you honestly think it is an honourable thing to do said morris i honestly do think so i said i believe you're right he said then rather a footling idea struck him how would it be if we wrote a polite letter to the doctor he asked not me i said you may be sure that the doctor in his hard-earned vocation doesn't want polite letters from me or even you in fact it might so much annoy him that he might change his mind altogether and not put us on our honour at all but merely say we were to keep bounds which would be death to me not that i should do it in any case so after a lot more rot and jaw about his blessed honour morris came and the day was jolly fine to begin with and we went well armed for sport in general he had his butterfly net and killing bottle a beastly thing full of chemicals but merciful in its way because when you put a butterfly in and shut down the cork the butterfly becomes unconscious without pain and dies pretty comfortably all the same as morris said to me while we watched a lesser tortoise shell passing away death is death and the killing bottle was the only part of natural history he did not care about before we got to the quarry he was wondering if the chemicals in the bottle would be strong enough for a dragonfly i said you've got to jolly well catch them first i had the sandwiches and a sling made of leather which hurls a stone frightful distances i had also got in secrecy a packet of windsor pearl cigarettes and a box of matches these i did not intend to show to morris because it would have upset his honour again but i had been a smoker for years having been taught by steggles and it seemed to me if i couldn't have a cigarette in the summer holidays now and then i might as well give up smoking altogether there were tongue sandwiches and bread and butter ones and two hard-boiled eggs each and two large lumps of caraway seed cake it seemed a good deal to carry and yet not much to eat i also took an india rubber cup for water but morris said the water in the quarry was no doubt where the dragonflies lived in the first stages of their careers and he doubted if we could drink it with safety he little knew that he would soon drink it whether it was safe or not there was only one way into the quarry and that was down a very steep and dangerous place 
the opening into the quarry was all filled up and there were railings all around it to keep anybody from falling into it by night morris funked getting down for some time then a dragonfly actually soared past and so much excited him that he said he was ready if i went first i told him to see exactly what i did and then i went down at one spot the descent was very perilous owing to a huge stone that stuck out in the middle of the cliff you had to curl over it and feel with your feet for a tree root below then for one great moment you had to let go with your hands and clutch at a pointed stone on the right hand side this stone was always loose and wanted very delicate handling to me with years of practice it was easy but i felt sure it would be a bit of a twister for morris he lowered down his killing bottle and net and caterpillar box then he began to slowly descend but at the critical moment he stretched for the pointed stone before he had got his foot on the root and all his weight came on the stone with the terrible result that the stone gave way and when the big stone gave way about a million other stones gave way also so that morris fell to the ground in an avalanche of stones and the woods resounded with the sound my first thort was keepers and my second thort was morris he was alive and hardly hurt at all more than a sprained ankle he went very white and sat down and shivered and felt his bones and limbs one by one he said it was his first great escape from death and i said you may not have escaped all the same because you pulled down the cliff on your descent and that was the only way out of the quarry and now there isn't any way out at all which was perfectly true and not said to frighten morris getting out of the quarry was far far worse than getting in and wanted a nerve of iron which i hadn't mentioned to morris till i got him safely in but now he'd pulled down the place completely and left a naked precipice and my nerve of iron was no good in fact we were evidently going to have a great adventure and so i told morris it certainly spoilt the day for him because you can't very well have a ripping good picnic if you don't know how the picnic's going to end it's a fine place for natural history no doubt he said but we can't pretend we're going to have a good time now we're going to have a good time anyway i said he smiled in rather a ghastly way and said he hoped not because the weather was changing and it might rain later on then i told him that weather didn't matter as there was a pretty dry cave where freckles used to do his cooking of rabbits on half holidays morris seemed glad about the cave he rubbed his ankle and said so far as that went he felt pretty right presently he said there are certainly red admirals here in great quantities and also dragonflies but somehow i don't feel i've got the heart to kill anything for the moment especially after what i've just escaped myself death is death you'll be better after food i said but he wouldn't hear of food we must face the position he said here we are in a quarry and we can't get out yes i said very well then there being no food in the quarry except what we have brought with us we shall soon be hungry yes i said i am now morris went on trying to be calm but i could see the more he explained the situation the more frightened he got his voice shook when he said the next thing you can't go on being hungry for more than a certain time after you reach a certain pitch you die yes i said well there you are he said he fidgeted about with his killing bottle and things then made a hopeless sort of a sound like an engine letting off steam we must consider means of escape i said people come here sometimes no doubt only boys out of bounds said morris faintly oh what would i give to see the face of freckles peep over the top it's impossible i told him freckles is spending the holidays with some cousins in norfolkshire but there are often keepers in the woods to look after the game then we must shout at intervals night and day as long as we've got the strength to do it said morris before each shout we will eat a sandwich to increase our strength i said but morris fancied half a sandwich would be safer i thought it wasn't much good beginning by starving ourselves in adventures nobody begins by starving they end like that 
but morris who has a watch looked at it and said the time was only half past ten and that even if we were safe and within reach of food we should not eat any for two hours and a half but i said plainly i could not wait that time and it ended by our dividing the food into two heaps of exactly the same size to a crumb and i eat a sandwich boldly and fearlessly but morris shook his head and said it was foolhardy he took a very hopeless view from the first and even thought that perhaps when my food was all gone and his hardly begun i should turn on him with the fierceness of starvation and tear his food away from him but i said no morris whatever tortures i may suffer i am a gentleman and i would rather die a hundred times than take as much as one seed out of your piece of cake this comforted him rather he put his hand on his chin and stared before him in a very feeble manner death is death he began again that's the third time you've said that i told him and if you say it once more i'll punch your head now i'm going to utter the first great shout and i hope it may bring a keeper not thomas or waxy west for they are both very hard and beastly men and very likely wouldn't rescue us even if they knew we were here but the underkeeper masters he will certainly save us and if he does i'll give him my packet of cigarettes i shouted six times then i shouted six more times then i told morris to have a shot but he made such a piffling feeble squeak that you could hardly have heard him a quarter of a mile off lucky i can howl i said or we should both be done for without a doubt why a lamb that has lost his mother would get up more row than that morris was rather hurt at this he explained that he was making an australian sound taught him by freckles it may not be loud he said but it is a well-known sound in australia and travel great distances especially over water the mention of water made us go and look at the pond i was frightfully thirsty by now and drank some it was grey in colour but clear when seen in my india-rubber cup and quite wholesome to the taste morris doubted but still he drank i advised him to catch some dragonflies and he said he would after the next time for shouting had come we arranged that i should shout every half hour and morris wanted to give me one sandwich from his store as payment for the exertion of shouting but i scorned it and told him i would not think of doing so after the second shouting which did nothing used my sling a bit and nearly hit a bird and morris caught a dragonfly and let it go out of pity and then he caught another and kept it to see if the killing bottle would kill it it did after about half a minute in the bottle the dragon was gone and we shook him out and examined his beautiful markings of yellow and black and his transparent wings that had the colours of the rainbow on them when the sun fell on them in a particular manner morris stroked it in a sorrowful way it is out of its misery now i wish me and you were he said i said we hadn't begun our misery yet i advised him to eat a sandwich and he did but very reluctantly he said that water would keep life in the human frame for many weeks he also said that he felt in a damp place like this we might easily get pneumonia he wondered if i hadn't better shout every quarter of an hour he also thought his watch was getting far too slow owing to his fall down the side of the quarry the sun had gone behind some rather dark clouds and we couldn't be sure where it was the only thing that happened during the next hour was that the dragonfly came to again not being dead but merely insensible it lifted a paw rather feebly to its forehead and evidently had a headache then it took a step or two and shivered a lot somehow it gratefully cheered morris the dragonfly recovering he said it had come out of the jaws of death and so perhaps we should he gave it an atom of tongue out of a sandwich but it was not up to eating and turned away from it then morris got it some water to wet its glittering tail this certainly refreshed it and so morris dashed a few drops on its head which refreshed it still more at half past two it rose and flew several inches and at three it disappeared 
by this time i had eaten all my sandwiches and drunk tons of water and was peeling my first hard-boiled egg suddenly morris had an idea he had only eaten one sandwich and was of course famishing with hunger he said if you was to write a message and tie it round a stone and sling it into space it might be found and read then a rescue party would be arranged and we should be saved it was pretty good for morris and i took out my pocket-book instantly and wrote three messages and he wrote three he said it was like men on sinking ships who send off messages in bottles that are found many years afterwards in iceland and i said it was of course we hoped one at least of the six messages might be found pretty soon years afterward was no good to us i merely wrote lost in great wood quarry and unable to get out arnold foster come at once and morris wrote at the point of death in great wood quarry no escape food nearly gone a handsome reward will be given william arkwright henderson morris i asked him how he knew a handsome reward would be given and he said he didn't but he said he felt it was a safe thing to say and might make all the difference to anybody finding the message then i shot off the six messages wrapped round stones and they easily flew over the edge of the quarry i then shouted again and ate my first egg just when it began to rain morris had another great idea he said didn't you say something about a packet of cigarettes some time ago and i said yes and i am glad you reminded me about them because i just feel that one will do me a lot of good then i pulled them out and opened the packet and took one and lit it it is very restful in such an adventure as this i said morris then he explained his idea it is well known that when you are learning to smoke your appetite is often spoiled for a time now morris thought that if he smoked he would not want food and so much valuable food might be saved and life prolonged if necessary he said to you who smoke so easily no doubt it is no good but i have never smoked and if i took a cigarette and went through with it it might turn me off eating for some time this was true but i pointed out a great danger that morris had forgotten that is all right and i will of course share my cigarettes with you and as there are twenty that will be ten each i said but i must seriously warn you morris that to a perfect beginner like you many things might happen besides merely a feeling against tongue sandwiches you might be absolutely sick and then all the food in me would be wasted said morris in a very tragic tone he turned quite white at this idea he said it would be madness to do anything to weaken his system at such a critical time and i said so too then he asked me to go and smoke further off because the very smell made him feel rather strange after what i had told him i smoked three cigarettes bang off and they only made me hungrier than ever then the rain came rather bad and at four o'clock we entered the cavern at least i did but morris stood at the door ready to run out and shout if by lucky chance anybody came in sight on the edge of the quarry but nobody came and the next serious thing was that my voice began to get husky after so much shouting morris said it was the cigarettes but i told him it was owing to yelling all day every half hour which undoubtedly it was at six i went to sleep for some time in the cave and morris did not wake me because he said that i was gaining strength by it when i woke it was already darkish and i thought it would be a good idea to make a fire morris thought so too and we made one ready with a lot of dead fern that freckles had put long ago into the cavern we took the paper that had wrapped up our lunch and put it under the fern and covered it with my coat to keep it dry and after dark we lighted it and it made a good blaze for a minute but unfortunately went out owing to the rain the rain in fact began to pour steadily and it was a particularly dark evening morris became a simple worm after dark he took a small bite out of a sandwich and said his prayers from end to end every half hour 
i had only got my cake left now and it seemed to me better to have one good meal and have done with it than keep messing about like morris was so i finished my cake and tried to go to sleep again we found that water came through the roof of the cavern in rather large quantities and morris had a new terror he said if we can't get out of the quarry then i don't see how water can get out and so if it rains more than a certain amount the quarry will get full and we shall be drowned which showed what a footling state of mind morris had got into presently i sneezed and he said of course it was the beginning of pneumonia then he asked for a match to see the time and it was six minutes past ten then i shouted again at the cavern entrance without result he kept on asking for matches to see the time until there were only five left and i said we must keep these for emergencies and he said he supposed we must at last he went into a sort of sleep after shedding some tears and pretending it was a cold in his head then i lighted a cigarette and found much to my surprise that i was beginning to feel queer myself with a new sort of queerness quite new to me i woke morris and told him that i was sorry to say i was ill and he said he was undoubtedly very ill too and had been dreaming of his mother which he only did when frightfully ill he also asked me if i believed in ghosts and i said i thought i did and he said he always did there were some awfully strange noises happening outside at this time and i sacrificed another match and found it was nearly one o'clock then we went to the mouth of the cavern and listened to a peculiar creepy sound far off the rain had stopped and a sloppy looking moon was coming up morris shivered that might be the mournful yell of some wretched ghost he said it's owls i said but he did not think so he thought it was too miserable for owls it came nearer and certainly was not owls then a thought struck me it's a rescue party i said we shouted with all our might and screamed and yelled and presently there was an answering yell and we felt that with any luck we were now saved soon torches gleamed through the trees and there were sounds of human feet and language i said to morris we are now saved morris and if you are not going to eat your piece of caraway seed cake i should very much like to and he said you can eat everything i have such a feeling of thankfulness to be saved that i couldn't eat for the moment empty as i am besides there will be supper provided a man shouted above us and i heard the hated voice of waxy west be you the little devils down there he cried out yes we are mr west i answered him very loud we're doing no harm at all merely waiting quietly to be rescued we only came for dragonflies and the side of the quarry gave way unfortunately or we shouldn't have had to trouble you at such a late hour he growled in rather an unkind tone of voice and we saw there were two other men with him then they began to make arrangements for the rescue and one was told to go and get a rope if ever i catch you in this place again i'll break both your necks said waxy west and though this was rather strong it comforted morris in a way because it showed that west hadn't found his messages offering a handsome reward if there had been any question of that he would have been polite and cringing but he was just as usual we found out after that matron had got in a funk and gone to the big house where the people belonging to merivale great wood live and the people had sent their keepers in all directions to save us these keepers got a rope and made knots in it and lowered it down and told us that we must climb up it and i let morris go first which he did and then i went up and the keepers saw us home i told waxy west that i should mention the subject to my parents in india and that i hoped they might send at least a pound to him and he said it wasn't likely because he'd done them the worst turn any man could and he said that if i wanted to reward him i would never go into maryville great wood again and i promised i wouldn't go in again for a full month which he evidently didn't believe there was a frightfully good tuck waiting for us at school and the matron who had been blubbing said a great many rather unkind things while we ate it 
but she promised not to tell dr dunstan and he does not know even to this day morris didn't win the holiday competition because as he expected both slade and thompson minor brought back dragonflies he might easily have gone to the quarry again after the month i promised waxy west was over but nothing would tempt morris to go though i bought ten yards of good rope for my own use however he paid me sixpence for getting him back his killing bottle and his butterfly net and his caterpillar box which were forgot in the excitement of the rescue and that was all to the good End of chapter nine